Claude Wins will get started here in just a couple minutes. Hello everyone, welcome. We will be getting started here in probably another minute or so. Hello guys, um, welcome to our seventh installment of this wonderful leadership speakers of the Yo Leadership Speaker series um, that we're doing. So excited that you all can join us this evening from wherever you are located. Uh, we're going to go over some accessibility basics for you on Zoom. Um, we do have Haptin in the toolbar. It should be a CC button. Um, it's, you just click on it and say so subtitles, and you should have that. Also, we'll be putting a link in the chat um, for screen text if you want to view your captions on that side. Or we also do have um, our wonderful ASL, ASL interpreters. Um, they are available and they will be on the screen with us throughout the evening doing their amazing job. Next slide. Oh, uh, we have uh, we, we do have a Q and A section, so please send your questions in with uh, Eric from Q and A. Um, raise your hand; it's more accessible. And we'll I'll meet you guys. The question. And also, please use the chat if you need technical support. Um, I am Evan Melbourne. Uh, I am uh, a male with uh, blonde hair, blue eyes. I have. APERT syndrome, A P E R T syndrome. Um, and I'm also visually impaired. So, yeah, I'm excited we're being here. And now I'm going to welcome one of my good friends, one of my good friends, Tim Picardo, to introduce herself. Hello, my name is Tatum Tricarico, and I am a white woman with long brown hair, bangs, and brown glasses. And I am in wearing a Yo Disabled and Proud black t-shirt and in front of a cream colored wall. And I have a desk behind me that has a bunch of little trinkets on it, including a pride flag and a couple um, stuffed unicorns and things like that. Um, and I have a disability pride flag on my wall that is a black background with different colored zigzags through it. Um, and today I am going to talk to you all about what the speaker series is. Um, so we are doing monthly installments of interviews with disabled activists and leaders. Um, and we are doing that in order to sort of teach and learn from these disabled people. Um, and those um, leaders are talking about their lives and their activism and how they engage with the disability community. And we as youth are learning how we can engage with the disability community as well. Um, in the past, we have learned from activists like Alice Wong, Judy Human, and Haben Gurma, as well as a bunch of other amazing activists. So if you want to, you can go to our YouTube channel, CFILC's YouTube um, under CFILC Nonprofit, 
and Jessica will put a link for us in the chat right now. Um, and if you click on that link, you can see all of our former um, interviews that we've done, and they are just really beautiful and meaningful conversations that we've had with people. So I really hope you can check them out. Um, and with that, I will pass to one of my good friends, Cami. Hello, everyone. My name is Cami Marble. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a white woman with short brown hair, and I'm wearing round blue glasses. I am also wearing the black Yo Disabled and Proud shirt, and behind me, I have a dark blue and purple Yo Disability Leadership Speaker Series background, which has the black and white Yo Disabled and Proud logo in one corner, as well as a picture of Eric Harris in the other corner. And I would like to let you know tonight about another project that Yo is working on. We are so excited to be launching the Disability Belongs podcast, where we are going to share reflections on being disabled in the real world. So if you would like more information about the podcast, you can head over to Instagram and follow us at disability underscore belongs underscore podcast. And if you follow us on that account, as well as at Yo Disabled and Proud, and like our first post on the Disability Belongs podcast page, you will be entered to win a super cool Disability Belongs sticker. And with that, I would like to introduce our newest member of the CFILC, CFILC team, Jessica. So Jessica, do you want to come on and introduce yourself? For sure. Hi. My name is Jessica and my pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a brown Mexican-American woman with brown curly hair and blonde highlights. And I am wearing a gold and gray sweatshirt and blouse. Um, moreover, I have the Yo Disability Speaker Series background with the Yo Disabled logo and an Eric Harris photo. With that in mind, I am so proud and honored to be here with y'all. I am very excited towards being able to work with youth. I come from a background of working with youth, such as March for Our Lives. Um, with that in mind, I am so deeply excited to work with the Yo Disabled and Proud program because I want to make sure that um, youth voices are being heard and represented on services and disability policy issues. With that in mind, I'll pass it back to Kami. Thanks, Jessica. And now, without further ado, I would like to welcome on our guest speaker tonight, Eric Harris. Eric is a Director of Public Policy at Disability Rights California, which you might hear us refer to as DRC tonight. He is also a board member of the Resources for Independent Living in Sacramento and a founding member of the Sacramento Roland Kings of the National Wheelchair Basketball Association. If you would like to follow Eric on social media, you can do so on Twitter and Instagram at E-M-O-N-Y 21. Welcome, Eric. We're so happy to have you here tonight. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with everyone. Uh, my name is Eric Harris. Um, my pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I am an African-American male with medium to dark brown skin. I have short black hair. I have a beard and short mustache. Um, I'm wearing glasses uh, and I'm currently wearing a navy blue um, polo shirt with a white undershirt. And I'm in a room with white walls uh, behind me. Um, I have a white door over my left shoulder and a mirror over my right shoulder. Um, I'm really looking forward to the conversation here today. Yeah, thank you so much for being here, Eric. We're really excited for this conversation, too. Um, I think it's going to be a really good evening with a lot of cool nuggets of wisdom. Um, and so I think before we get really into all of the good disability advocacy stuff. Um, I just wanna ask, I know that we're in a really interesting space in history and in time right now. Um, so I wanna ask how you're doing, how you're doing in the midst of this ongoing pandemic and how you're um, feeling and just kind of where you're at with all of that and like address that that is really present, especially for the disabled community. Absolutely. You know, I, I, I feel like um, the last um, 18, 19 months has really been uh, a bit of a roller coaster. 
Um, I have both kind of personally and of course with family and what's going on um, throughout the state and throughout the country, um, especially with our community and, um, and not just the disability community directly, but of course um, the disability community that intersects with the African-American community, um, Latinx community and other communities um, that we all represent. Um, and the fear that comes with um, what is happening and what has happened with COVID, all of the illnesses and deaths that have occurred over the last um, 18 months, the added anxiety and um, sense of frustration and all that comes with, um, th that has come with this pandemic. Um, it is it has all been real, even for those of us who, um, who have been in kind of the advocacy policy space, um, we've all recognized it. And I think something that's been important for me has been to uh, sometimes take a step back and, and understand that it's okay um, to acknowledge that um, that these are, in many cases, challenging times for a lot of us. Definitely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for noting all of that. That's really helpful. Mm -hmm. I think before we get too far into the interview, could you give us a little bit of information about what exactly is Disability Rights California and what is your role there? Absolutely. Um, so Disability Rights California is a protection and advocacy nonprofit agency here in the state. Um, our role is to advocate for all people with disabilities in California. Um, we're part of a larger nationwide network of protection and advocacy organizations. Um, so there is a disability rights um, organization, a statewide PNA, as they're called, protection and advocacy organization in every state and every territory in the country. Um, so there's a disability rights Texas, a disability rights North Carolina, disability rights New York. Um, and we all are a part of the National Disability Rights Network, NDRN, which is located in Washington, D.C. They do some of our um, national advocacy at the nation's capital um, with the with Congress and with the executive branch, um, currently, of course, the um, uh, Biden administration. Um, what my role is here at Disability Rights California um, is I'm one of 300 staff at DRC. Uh, we have about 100 attorneys. Um, and what my role specifically is, um, I'm the director of public policy. So I work um, and I'm, I am um, over kind of the unit that works on legislative issues in the state capitol, that works on other public policy issues at the federal level and at the local level. Um, so our team um, in the public policy or legislative team, we have about, um, we have about seven total um, members of our unit, um, four of which are legislative advocates, including myself. I'm, uh, I also happen to be a legislative advocate, a lobbyist. Um, and um, what we have to do kind of as a team um, is uh, put together policies, um, bill ideas that we can present to the legislature, but also um, address any policy or bill ideas that we recognize that impact the disability community. And we advocate either for those issues or in some cases against certain issues that we think might be harmful to the disability community. Um, and also um, just kind of ongoing relationship building um, with policy leaders and the disability community here in California. Um, so it's really important that we have good relationships as an organization and that we bring other organizations like CFILC and other statewide and even local organizations, disability organizations to the table um, to help with um, decision-making at, at a policy level. Yeah, that's really cool. I just, um, I just like in the last probably year and a half have learned about the disability rights in different states and have found it to just be so um, empowering to know that there's that like group of people who are just like 
here to like be of support in all those different ways. So I really appreciate all of the work that you're doing and that all 300 employees or whatever you said are doing. Um, it's just a really wonderful program. Um, and so I guess kind of you talked about this a little bit in your first answer, but um, I guess one of my questions is just how um, with um, kind of everything being so different based around the pandemic, um, how has the pandemic affected your role as a public policy coordinator? And I think you addressed that like a little bit, um, but is there any like particular things that have kind of shifted um, in what you're advocating for or in what kind of advocacy you're doing? Um, yeah, I would love to hear about that. Absolutely. I'll start with kind of how it's how it has changed in terms of um, the process. So, uh, of course, the state capital in California is in Sacramento. Um, that's where I'm currently based. Um, and that is um, where I've worked um, for a number of years. Um, and typically, the way advocacy in the state capital would go is that we would um, go to the actual building itself um, and go into offices and bring physical documents a lot of times and have conversations, have meetings. A lot of that has changed over the last, since the pandemic started in March of 2020, um, we have been advocating virtually. Um, a lot of the, um, a lot of the uh, work that we've done has been over Zoom or Microsoft Teams or Skype. Um, and so that has been somewhat of an adjustment. Um, some of the committee hearings, all of the committee hearings have been done virtually, either on the phone or um, over some form of video conferencing. Um, and frankly, it has been um, a pretty good experience for me personally. Um, and I think for a lot of disabled people, um, we have uh, uh, been able to take advantage of, um, of the access in terms of um, being able to attend more um, hearings, um, being able to participate more. So hopefully some of these, um, these changes remain uh, more permanent, uh, but we'll see how, how that works out. And as far as issue areas, of course, we've had to advocate um, for um, access to vaccines, making sure that the disability community is protected and given opportunities to protect ourselves and stay safe, um, and a number of other issues. Um, but I'd say vaccines has been um, one of the top issues, making sure that the disability community um, remains protected um, and not to mention a number of other issues in California um, combined with the vaccine and where we're talking about fire safety, when we're talking about other uh, mental health protections um, and services, all of these different um, issues have had to be advocated over the last um, 19 months or so. That's huge. Oh, thank you for speaking about that. There's so many important issues and I think that are important, especially during the pandemic and especially to disabled people in the pandemic. I know as we've had started this conversation, we've talked a lot about what the term advocacy, I was wondering if you could give kind of a definition, like your own definition, what does advocacy mean to you? And how is that different, different from like lobbying? So, yeah, I would say they're, they're honestly very similar. Um, Advocacy is communicating in any way, um, whether it's um, verbally, whether it's through um, writing, whether it's through um, collective kind of gathering. Um, it is communicating um, um, rights, whether they be civil rights, disability rights um, for groups of people. Um, and it can include yourself. One of the cool things um, and I know I'll talk about this a little bit later, but one of the cool things about advocating for the disability community for me has been, I of course have a disability. I was born with congenital hip dislocation. Um, so I've been, and I've been a wheelchair user for most of my life. Um, and so some of the issues that I get to advocate for 
uh, directly impact me and directly impact people who have similar lived experience to me. Um, and so that's been a cool part of advocacy for me. I'd say lobbying is, uh, is advocacy, but at a, on a policy level, um, whether it's at the state level um, in the state capitol, um, you can lobby at the federal level in Congress or with the executive branch, either the governor's office or, um, or in the presidential administration. Um, and it's important to, of course, understand the different rules and differences between advocacy and lobbying because certain organizations have the ability to lobby um, DRC being one of them. Other organizations have certain have more limitations on how much lobbying they're able to do advocacy at the state level or federal level. That actually leads perfectly into the next question, which is how did you transition from a role of personal advocacy to this broader public policy work? What was that process like for you? Absolutely. So I, you know, I was fortunate enough um, to be uh, raised in a family of um, advocates, civil rights leaders, advocates, educators. Both of my parents are educators, um, professors at the UC level at UC Merced in the Central Valley. Uh, my Both of my grandmothers were teachers for um, their entire careers. Um, and so I was able to see kind of up close the education aspect. Um, but my, my um, parents and Grandparents are also civil rights advocates as well. They advocate for other people, not just themselves, but other communities, communities that they work in and care about. So when I was young, um, I uh, learned how to advocate for myself. Um, when I noticed something that was um, inaccessible or um, any in any way discriminatory um, against me, I would, of course, uh, and not, of course, because everybody's at different stages in their advocacy um, life and advocacy kind of um, path. Uh, but I learned at a pretty early age that it's important for me um, to speak up um, and to communicate if I uh, feel like I'm being treated unfairly. Um, and that changed for me, honestly, when I started participating in adaptive sports. I started playing wheelchair basketball when I was in high school and met a lot of other um, kids in, with disabilities. Um, and I started playing uh, in a, with a program um, in Berkeley, California, known as the Bay Area Outreach and Recreation Program. They really encouraged me um, to advocate on you know, issues um, at an even higher level when we would be traveling from one part of the country to another or attending events together. Um, I really just felt motivated um, to advocate for my friends and my competitors and colleagues. Um, and that really kind of got, got me started down the path of advocacy at a different level, more than just advocating for myself, but advocating for others too. That's really cool. I really love, um, I don't know, just that story of how you like we're able to like figure it out through your family and through just like learning how to do that. Um, and I think that kind of brings up a question that we were, you, you talked a little bit about it. So if you want to say more on this, um, we were kind of saving for later, but what, um, what was it like to sort of be part of that adaptive sport, um, experience? Was that something you said you like grew up doing a little bit of it and like, I don't know, I would just love to hear more of what that's like and how that's like played an impact on your life um, broader than advocacy, but also if it's played an impact there, but yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So I have always been involved and interested in sports. Um, from the time I was a little kid, I played able-bodied sports. I used leg braces growing up. So I would play basketball and baseball and tennis and golf. I would, I would play every sport that I could because I, um, I just thought it was fun and I enjoyed being a competitor. Um, and when I was in high school, I was introduced to 
wheelchair basketball, which honestly changed my life. It, it put me down a path of, um, of advocacy and being a part of a disability community that, um, that I've now embraced, of course, um, throughout my life. And just, um, it's where I've, I love working and, and, and experiencing. And so I uh, started playing wheelchair basketball when I was in high school. We were one of the best teams in the country at the time. We won a national championship um, when I was a junior. Um, I got scholarship opportunities to play in college. I played at the University of Arizona um, for five years on scholarship and was able to travel more all around the country and, and even internationally to play. Um, and developed a friendship and relationship with other young people, other people with disabilities. Um, and um, it encouraged me to, to advocate at a higher level. Um, I um, still, you know, um, participate in some forms of adaptive sports, most recently playing for the Sacramento Rolling Kings wheelchair basketball team here in Sacramento. Uh, which it was, you know, part of the National Wheelchair Basketball Association um, and also played for the San Francisco Wheelchair Giants uh, wheelchair softball team. Um, and so I still find it very fun and keeps me active and involved. Um, and also um, I still stay in touch with a lot of my friends from throughout the country um, who all played wheelchair basketball, wheelchair sports, men's and women's players who we, we all stay in touch. Um, most recently watched the um, Paralympic Games, which were in Tokyo. Um, they, um, of course, were, were postponed um, until uh, later um, after 2020. They, they just happened a couple months ago. Um, but a lot of my friends who play wheelchair basketball and other sports, um, it was really, really fun to be able to to watch them and kind of keep track of what they were doing because a lot of those players are still good friends of mine. That's really cool. I love, um, yeah, I just really love that. I love the ways that like, that just kind of brings up like that disability community and like, I don't know, I'm not a huge sports person, but it's still nice to like hear that story of just like connecting with people and like being able to do, I don't know, stuff that you want to do. That's really cool. Um, and I think also kind of leads into a question that I really wanted to ask you personally um, of kind of this idea of like self-care and like caring for your mental and physical and emotional well-being in the midst of advocacy work because I am um, <laughs> yo disabled and proud youth um, in the disability movement or whatever and so I am as are the other three of us four of us or whatever um, and so we're just all kind of like budding activists right now, hoping to do advocacy work. And so I'm wondering how you kind of, um, I don't know, hold space for yourself in the midst of all of it, um, because I know it can be really hard. And so is there like, I'm assuming that wheelchair basketball and different sports and things of that nature and like paying attention to the um, Paralympic Games and stuff like that um is part of that but um I'm wondering if you could talk to us more about like that sort of like self-care but also like emotional and like rest space that you give yourself yeah you know um because I've been fortunate enough to be in this space um for a while um I've developed really good friendships and relationships with other advocates um from throughout the country um, who all I, all, I admire all of them. Um, I know Haben Girma is somebody who spoke um, to you all previously. She's a good friend of mine. Um, Judy Human is somebody who I've looked up to forever. And every time I'm in her presence, even if it's over Zoom, I get chills because she's incredible. Um, um, and there's so many, um, so many others who I've been able to to be close with Lydia XZ Brown, who's been um, somebody that I've known for about a decade. Emily Ladau, also somebody that I've known for a decade. Um, and these are all people who have been involved in this movement um, for a really long time, even though 
Some of them are are really young. Um, and you know, my uh, you know, one of my mentors, um, our executive director at DRC, um, Andy Amparado, um, who's been um, a disability advocate for decades, um, is someone who I know that I can always reach out to um, to talk um, about issues that I might be seeing or experiencing. Um, so all of those folks really help me kind of keep things into perspective. And then I have a really supportive family support system and friends who um, always kind of keep me um, grounded and keep me on track. Um, and if I'm ever feeling um, uncomfortable or going through a difficult time, they're always able to, um, to kind of help me um, and keep me um, kind of headed in the right direction and keep things into perspective. Um, and then, you know, of course, that along with enjoying the some of the fun things that I like doing, like uh, watching movies or watching, and of course, not being able to do this in person, um, the same way that we were able to before. Um, but I watch a lot of shows, listen to a lot of music, um, stuff like that, being able to read books, um, and um, and talk about some of those things with with others who I know enjoy those things as well. Thanks for sharing that. I know community has been such an important aspect for me and such an exciting part of being a part of Yo Disabled and Proud. With that, what advice would you give to disabled youth about the movement? I know you said you have a lot of mentors. I think you probably have looked people looking up to you as a mentor as well what advice would you give them how can youth get involved in the movement so I think that um you know I'm really excited about the young people who are entering this um, advocacy space um because you all are so talented um and and um bring a lot to the table um so it's funny because, I mean, it feels like I just got started, <laughs> and uh, but I know that there's a, a generation that's coming and a generation that's very active. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing all the work that you all are able to do. Um, and I hope that I can be somebody um, along with, I'm sure, all of the other names that I've mentioned, um, that we can be helpful um, and lifting up your voices because you all are the ones who are going to be the decision makers, um, the, the folks in policy, elected office, all of these positions. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, social media, of course, um, is a way where you can stay connected and be connected with people, not just in your community um, locally um, or your state even, but nationally and even internationally. Something that um, really helped me um, was when I was in Washington, D.C., meeting people with other disabilities from other parts of the country and other parts of the world who also were advocates and cared about disability justice, disability rights. Um, it was uh, a really great experience for me um, to be in an internship at AAPD, American Association for People with Disabilities, um, and room with somebody um, who had ADHD or who had a hearing impairment or who had other disabilities, because it really kind of expanded what I thought in terms of disability, in terms of young people with disabilities, um, and it elevated all of our voices um, when we would kind of come together and say, hey, this isn't just an issue for somebody who uses a wheelchair or somebody who has um, this disability or that disability, but all of us are part of the same movement. Um, and doing that at a large level in Washington um, really helped expand what my perspective was. Um, and then meeting people who were doing it at a very high level in Washington um, to be introduced to them and then meet um, who they knew internationally who were doing the same work. So I really encourage um, young people to 
um, interact as as often as possible with other advocate leaders, with other advocates in um, different communities, um, and doing it over technology through Zoom or through social media is a really good way um, to do it and to amplify all of your voices. Yeah, thank you for that. I really love, um, yeah, I really love that. And just, um, it kind of honestly reminds me, I don't know if you're familiar with the disability pride flag that I happen to have in my weird little corner right here. Um, but the um, each of the lines represents a different kind of disability and they're all, they all run parallel to each other to show the um, like solidarity of, and then the zigzags are the barriers that we face. And so to show kind of the solidarity of disabled people together um, has just been a really huge thing in my life. And so I really, um, I really appreciate you commenting on that. And it's helpful for me to kind of remember at the forefront of my mind in going into advocacy spaces. Um, And I want to ask, I think it kind of ties into that coming alongside each other really. Um, But with you as um, this advocate at Disability Rights California, um, I'm wondering, like, I know that all of you at Disability Rights California sort of come alongside people who are disabled in the workforce or in education or in a bunch of other places probably. Um, And I'm wondering if you have any advice for people who are facing ableism or needing to advocate for accommodation in those spaces. Um, I shared on the last interview, I think, and I'll share now that I um, just consistently throughout my life have experienced a lot of educational ableism um, and continue to go up against that. I'm functionally blind and so need things in braille and need things accessible and all of that. Um, And so I, um, this is just a very like helpful question for me, as I know is a helpful question for so many people, um, kind of what advice you have for people who are facing ableism and facing, um, yeah, just discrimination or a need for access and are not getting those accommodations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, You know, as I mentioned earlier, all of us are at different stages of our advocacy um, kind of life or career. Um, And that is totally cool. It's totally fine for some of us um, to be at a space in our lives where um, we're able to advocate for ourselves in a a very kind of vocal way. Um, And then others who are in maybe the earlier stages where they're, you know, kind of um, navigating this process um, and navigating advocating for themselves for the first time and just kind of what that might feel like. I think the first thing is to um, remember that there have been a lot of people over decades who have advocated for disabled people. Um, People like Judy Heumann um, who um, were literally on the front lines um, and literally put their bodies um, in the way of um, of discrimination uh, and um, and so many over decades who um, spoke to um, access and accessibility, um, of course, leading to the 504 protests, leading to the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, and so at a on a kind of a basic civil rights level. It's important that disabled people recognize that we do have um, these rights. We do have these civil rights. We do have um, reasonable accommodations rights. Um, And so it's important first to kind of keep that in mind. Um, Second though, it's important to remember that that is the floor, um, that that is just the beginning in terms of what our overall rights are um, and that the ADA um, is is a law that we're, um, you know, we as a community deserve in terms of um, in terms of having those rights. But that um, there are still advocates out there, um, all of us who believe that the disability community deserves more than just the ADA. Um, that um, we should truly have equity. Um, and be treated completely fairly um, without any discrimination. 
Um, and then kind of the third point is sometimes it's learning how to be an advocate for yourself or learning who um, can help be an advocate for you or with you. Um, and knowing that you're not alone in your experiences. There are so many throughout the country um, and really throughout the world who've experienced discrimination in different ways based on their disability, based on race, gender. Um, and so it's it really, uh, I think a circumstance where, um, where we as a community um, should recognize and, and understand that we're all a part of this together um, and that you're not alone and that you can reach out to uh, mentors or friends or other advocates who, um, who are in this process as well, um, who could hopefully give kind of words of advice and words of wisdom and maybe even help with the advocacy that you might be um, trying to do, whether it's at school or at work um, or any other space where anybody might be feeling discrimination. Thank you. It's such a good reminder that we're not alone. You're not an isolated disabled person who has to face all this advocacy on their own. And with that, I think you started to touch on this kind of the idea of intersectionality or multiply marginalized identities. How has the intersection of disability and race impacted your life and your work as, as an advocate? And how has it impacted your leadership as well? Absolutely. So, um, of course, being an African American and being born with a disability, I have lived in both intersections my entire life. I've always been an African American. I've always been a Black man. I've always been a per person with a disability. Um, and I know, um, you know, all of us live in some, we're, we're, of course, disabled people, but we're also living um, with other identities. Um, and I think I'm so glad that the disability community, especially over the last um, 10 years, 15 years or so, has really embraced um, um, intersectionality, um, the importance of recognizing that um, intersections matter, that somebody with a mental health disability who's also African-American faces um, additional challenges potentially um, with law enforcement, for instance, or with discrimination in healthcare. Um, somebody who is an immigrant, a Latinx immigrant um, who has a disability is going to face additional discrimination. Somebody who is LGBTQIA+, who also has a disability, is going to face additional discrimination. Um, and it's been really cool um, to be the director of public policy, especially for a statewide organization in California, because um, you know I recognize, we recognize as, a, as an organization um, that California is extremely diverse, that we have so many groups of marginalized people um, in large numbers um, throughout the state, um, of course being the most populated state in the country um, and really, really diverse. Um, it's been great working on policies, working with organizations um, that might represent other marginalized communities on the issues that we care about from a public policy standpoint. Um, prior to coming to DRC, I actually was the legislative advocate for the uh, California State NAACP. So I had worked on statewide issues that impact the African-American community. Um, and while I was there, I would always think about disability issues because um, a lot of times issues that negatively impact um, African, the African-American community like COVID for instance, also negatively impacts the African-American community that also has disabilities. Um, same with the work that I'm doing at Disability Rights California and the work that we do as an organization as a whole, it's important for us to recognize um, that it's important to bring Black voices, Latinx voices, AAPI voices, Native American voices, um, especially because 
um, the history of the disability rights movement has been largely white and largely male, largely straight, um, mostly uh, people with uh, mobility disabilities who are wheelchair users, um, you know, take up most of the space in figuratively in the room. Um, and I think that it has been crucial that we've brought in voices from other marginalized groups in the disability community um, because those issues need to be at the forefront as well. Those, those voices need to be heard. Um, and it's really important um, from a disability justice standpoint, disability rights standpoint, um, that all of these communities are um, brought to the table. Yeah, that's really cool. I, yeah, I just really appreciate kind of all of the advocacy that you're doing in all of these different spaces. And the, um, as you mentioned, the need to just recognize that like there is so much intersectionality in the disability community and that um yeah that there is not one way that disabled people exist but that there's um yeah there's queer people and there's black people and there's native american people and just all of these different identities who also are experiencing disability um is just a really beautiful thing when we get it right <laughs> and very sad when we miss the mark on that um, because it doesn't feel like the fullness of who we are. So I think um, I wanna kind of pop in because you were talking about some of the public policy um, work that you were doing and ask what um, kind of what policy issues are, um, is Disability Rights California working on right now? And like what, um, maybe like what are some of your things that you're working on or your biggest interests or like just what's what's going on in the world of public policy and disability? Absolutely. Um, so in California, um, we have a legislative session that runs from January through um, really September, uh, first week of October. Um, so our legislative session just ended, um, at least at the state level here, and it's different for every state. Um, and we had a number of issues um, that we were advocating for um, and against in some cases um, this year. Um, we advocate on issues impacting the intellectual and developmental disability community, mental health, long-term care and supports, um, education, um, public safety. All of these different issues are really voting rights. All of these issues um, are issues that, that we have um, experts in and we give input um, at the um, different policy levels, local, statewide, and federal. This year, we had a number of issues that we really um, felt were crucial um, to advocate for and that we had bills going through the legislative process. Um, one of those bills um, was SB 639, which was um, a bill that was authored by Senator um, Elena DeRazzo. She represents the part of Los Angeles. Um, and we were co-sponsors of that bill along with the State Council on Developmental Disabilities, um, Legal Aid at Work out of the Bay Area. Um, and we um, had a, a huge coalition of disability organizations, including CFILC, including DREDF, um, Disability Rights Education Defense Fund um, and labor organizations. Uh, the main issue of that bill was um, phasing out um, the use of subminimum wage, um, people with disabilities being paid below minimum wage. Of course, that's a national issue. Um, and some states have begun to um, create policies to phase out subminimum wage. Um, but California up until this year had not um, had a law to phase it out. Um, and it's really interesting because a lot of people with disabilities either have heard about it or are aware of it in some way, even those of us who um, have never been paid some minimum wage, but we've either heard about it from other folks in the community. We know about it, especially with the intellectual and developmental disabilities community. Um, and so uh, it's an issue that our community is generally 
um, aware of, but so many people out there, um, so many of the members of the legislature were unaware um, that this was a current practice, that this was a current law. So many people that we reached out to to get support for the bill, um, especially in the labor community, were unaware that this was going on. Um, so it really was um, an issue that we were able to get co a coalition of support, a lot of um, people sending in letters and making phone calls and really being involved and active. Um, and we had a, an author, um, Senator Elena Durazo from Los Angeles, who really went above and beyond um, from her perspective and from our perspective in terms of um, really speaking out in favor of this bill and saying that this is a civil rights issue. Um, and um, and we need to do better. If we're gonna advocate for equal pay for all these other groups of people, we should also advocate for equal pay for the disability community. Um, so it was, uh, it was definitely an experience. It was in some ways stressful and you had to go through a lot of emotions up and down, hearing some of the opposition and some of the other folks who um, didn't necessarily think that this process and this way to do things, eliminating subminimum wage was the best idea. Um, but fortunately, um, it passed the legislature and was signed by the governor um, a couple weeks ago. Um, and so we're really, really thrilled about that. Um, it was our um, priority, top priority bill this year. Uh, we actually had um, some really good media attention um, in the newspapers and on podcasts and radio shows talking about the importance of this issue. Um, so we're, I'm really, really excited about that. Uh, but there's so many different issues that we advocate for mental health services for students. Um, we advocate for uh, protections against, um, against any discrimination or um, violations in nursing homes for senior citizens. Um, and just so many different policy issues that come up throughout the year. And it always, we're gonna do more next year and have hopefully other bills that, that we'll present and, and um, that get addressed by, by the governor and we'll see how that goes. Um, and then, you know, there are issues at the federal level that we wanna be aware of and involved in, um, issues relating to SSI and SSDI um, making sure that um, disabled people have access to housing, transportation, um, all of these, these issues are just super important. And so, um, so all of it is uh, part of what our advocacy kind of platform is looking like for next year. Thank you for all of that information. It's so great to hear what you're advocating for. And I think it's exciting to hear when things have passed and all that work you put into it was successful. This is kind of switching gears a little bit, but how has your advocacy work changed over time? Have you noticed differences with social media now and people getting involved in that way? Has that changed the work that you do? You know, I'd say that social media has been a big um, part of the change. It's allowed all of us to access um, people that we might not have otherwise been able to access, information that we might not have been able to access. But I think one of the most important, and it hasn't been a huge change, it's just been something that I've emphasized um, in the work that I do and the work that we do as a team, is really getting community input on um, our ideas and on what the community actually needs. Um, so for instance, if I'm working on an issue um, that directly impacts the mental health community, particularly um, students with mental health disabilities or, um, or people who are unhoused with mental health disabilities, um, it's making sure that I and our team, that we're actually communicating with those communities to know what are they experiencing? What can we do to help them instead of me by, my, by myself coming up with ideas or coming up with 
um, bills that that would best serve in quotes those communities, um, but actually finding out directly from them what is it that we can do, how can we partner, how can we work together, um, and so I think that's been. Um, something that I've really tried to emphasize even more um, and really trying to encourage other people that I work with to consider um, that as well. Thank you for sharing that. We are just about getting ready to transition over to Q&A, so I'm going to bring Evan on to start that. And as a reminder for our audience, you can throw your questions into the Q&A feature for us to ask Eric. So I'll hand it off to Evan for the Q&A. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, wow. Okay, that's me. Um, so uh, we, we talked a lot about mental health, uh, disabilities, but um, I believe we have a question from Sophia in the chat about, I mean, in the Q&A section, sorry, um, about like these uh, uh, DIC or the Disability Resource of California Hopefully I got that right. Um, do a lot of stuff with invisible disabilities, such as mental illness, such as um, stuff that you may not see on the surface. Absolutely. Thanks, Evan, for that question. Um, so we have a um, several attorneys who are experts um, in mental health advocacy, um, have worked in mental health for a really long time. We also have um, members of our staff who identify as um, individuals with mental health disabilities. And so we really um, try to develop a strategy to best serve um, people with mental health disabilities. Um, and one of the bills that we actually had this year was SB 14 authored by Senator Portantino. Um, and the bill addressed uh, mental health services for students with disabilities and, and excused absences for students with, di with mental health disabilities. So we, we definitely um, try to prioritize um, mental health as one of the issue areas that we want to um, continue to do positive work in. Um, so it's definitely an issue that, that we uh, keep in the forefront. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, so much to me, just pers not only like because I'm a just playing this bad fit, but I also, um, it's I make it, I try to make it common knowledge that I do have, um, I've been battling depression and anxiety for 10 plus years, and I've, I've seen that I've also have friends who uh, have mental, uh, disabil mental health disabilities. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've seen the effects on it firsthand, much less on myself from just growing up and battling it. And, but uh, the other question we have is, uh, is there uh, inclusion for people in, uh, with disabilities in emergency planning and dis disability uh, uh, disaster response, like uh, BRC prior uh, priority area? Because now that we got the power set offs coming back on, yeah. we got the earthquakes, we got all these different crazy wildfires. Is that, is that priority for you guys too? or? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, we've, and it's funny because we actually um, work very closely um, with Christina Mills um, at CFILC, um, Russell Rawlings, um, other um, advocates um, that are statewide on the disability issues and the accessibility concerns potentially with power shutoffs. Um, and you know, being in California um, and being a policy person, just generally, it's so important um, to be aware of what's going on kind of currently and what the trends appear to be. Um, we recognize in California that fires and droughts, unfortunately, do not appear to be going away. Um, they are getting worse and um, the disability community, it's so important that we have a voice um, when these decisions are being made because power shutoffs can have such a detrimental impact on those of us who might need to use um, different uh, equipment um, and 
uh, or might need to be evacuated. Um, all of these things, we wanna make sure that the disability community has a voice um, and is not forgotten about. Um, and so it has been one of the issue areas that we have prioritized, especially over the last several years. Thank you for that. Uh, I think we have time a couple more. Um, so on, you mentioned uh, doing your work on six, um, SB 639 about the sub-minimum wage bill. Um, why do you think, obviously I can't comprehend this, but why do you think there's so much opposition to that? And how do you guys handle, handle that kind of? Yeah. Absolutely. So um, that was honestly one of the, it's one of the difficult things about policy work is even if um, you believe in the organizations that you work with and the author all believe that the issue that you're working on and advocating for is common sense um, and would definitely benefit the community that you're advocating um, on behalf of, um, there are circumstances where others might um, have uh, either disagreements or have other experiences. So for SB 639, we had some um, parents um, who were concerned because they um, believe that eliminating subminimum wage jobs could potentially um, force their um, their children or their loved one to not have um, a job at all, that this um, would cost these, um, these uh, organizations um, too much money that um, businesses, if they have to pay $15 an hour um, for somebody who has, um, you know, a number of disabilities, especially um, who, uh, you know, might not be able to, quote unquote, compete with other people without disabilities, um, that those jobs might not be available anymore. Um, and so that's why in part of our um, negotiations, we had to uh, postpone the implementation of this phase out until 2025. So unfortunately, we had to kind of give a few years so that companies, businesses could make the adjustment and prepare for, um, for this implementation and this phase out. I know a lot of self-advocates, a lot of advocates, family advocates and others uh, would say, hey, you know, DRC, Eric, why don't you guys just implement it immediately and let's get on with it. This is a terrible um, law and let's you know do away with it right away and start the phase out next year. Um, but it's part of the negotiation process and part of our acknowledgement that for some businesses it is going to be difficult for them to address adjust um, and and pay um, uh, minimum wage um, to um, all of their disabled employees, but. We, uh, so that was kind of part of the back and forth and why there were some who, um, who did oppose that bill, um, but it didn't uh, discourage us. We know that that's just part of um, the policy process. All right, I have a, I have a couple more questions. Actually, I think one of my, um, uh, one of my uh, coworkers has a question for you, but, um, as a, as an avid basketball fan, um, I, I have to ask: Is this is opening night for basketball? Um, what do uh, are you? First off, are you a Kings fan? What do you think about chances this year? <laughs> oh man! So I um, I am a an avid basketball fan. Um, it's funny because um, my uh, my brother, um, we're all and and my fiance were watching um, all the games uh, this week. We're really excited. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the, the NBA players have been um, so great, gracious and, and um, acknowledging adaptive sports over the years. Um, so I'm excited about, 
about this season, excited to, to see all the fun entertainment and competitiveness. Um, as far as uh, the Kings, I, I am a Kings fan. Um, and unfortunately, it's been a long time since the Kings have been good. Um, not since I was in high school. And now I'm, you know, long since high school. Um, but I have, you know, the beginning of the season is always a time for hope. You uh, kind of keep your fingers crossed, hope that everyone stays healthy and kind of see how things go. Uh, but I'm just excited to be able to watch um, watch the sport. I think it's a fun um, sport. It's cool to see athletes do incredible things. And, and so I'm really looking forward to, to that part of it. Uh, but what was your second question again, Evan? Yeah, I, uh, pretty much what's it, I guess what's your experience being an athlete as being a disabled, being a disabled athlete and being a fan of like be, going to say, like going to the um, Golden Lung Center or Art Arena, mm-hmm. if, from a, if folks don't know, that's the old team during that before the Golden Lung Center. Yeah. Um, but what was it, what's it like for you going to those games? as a disabled athlete and as a disabled person? No, it's, it's really cool. I'm actually, I'm really glad you asked that question because um, it wasn't long ago, um, you know, I'd say 2005, 2006, um, when uh, a lot of my friends and I, we weren't able to watch wheelchair basketball on TV. Um, there wasn't, we felt almost like we were, um, we were pushed to the side and not included. Um, and uh, now you can watch the Paralympics on cable TV. Um, you can watch replays. They have videos. Um, and attending some of these games, um, you know, as an athlete and comparing wheelchair sports to, um, to able-bodied sports is really, really fun. Um, I... Uh, I, I honestly believe that wheelchair basketball is the most beautiful sport to be able to watch. I think that it's a perfect sport um, and all adaptive sports are really, really fun and cool to watch. So I'd encourage anyone, whether you're really interested in adaptive sports or if you're um, just curious, um, I'd encourage you all to check out highlights um, of the Paralympic Games or highlights of other um, games. And uh, there's adaptive sports programs, even for beginners in communities all throughout the state. So I'd encourage everyone um, to look into it and, and see if it might be something that they'd be interested in. Yeah, you know, I'm going to invite uh, Jessica back on the screen because I believe she has a, a question for you. Yes. For one, I really wanted to thank you for being here. Like, I honestly have felt encouraged and like uh, aspired with everything that you have done. Um, I do have, I guess, more of a personal question. And um, you mentioned a lot of the intersections of how like there's so many issues that are happening that intersect with one another that uh, like specifically affect um, all types of disproportionately impacted communities. So mine goes more so as someone who is part of the disabled community, but also part of like the immigrant community, like a big issue is oftentimes like the sense of fear of like being deported, like once going to the doctor, getting that type of support. So my question would be like, um, how would you encourage or like what type of work is being done towards making sure that like, there could be a safe community for like people to get like the proper um, healthcare system without necessarily fearing that like they might get deported or something along that line. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your question, Jessica. Um, You know, it's been a really cool experience for me, especially over the last year um, because DRC has um, embraced um, the issues that impact immigrants with disabilities. Um, And we've not only taken on the issue as an organization, but we've reached out to other organizations um, who uh, focus on immigration issues and brought up the disability impacts 
um, brought up the issues that the disability community faces when um, going through the immigration process or fearing being deported. Um, and I think that, you know, we're as an organization and I think as a disability community, we're kind of in the beginning stages of, of that process of really embracing like, hey, there's immigrants with disabilities that we need to make sure that we're thinking about and advocating for. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity out there um, for somebody like you, Jessica, or others that you might be connected with to constantly bring up the issues that immigrants with disabilities face, um, that, it, that we need to, as a community, as a disability community, and I'm sure from an immigrant immigration, immigrants perspective in terms of um, organizations that focus on immigration, that they can also add disability to the work that they do. Um, but it's having those people who can kind of bring those groups together um, and talk about, you know, the issues that impact both communities. Um, and so I think this is a really good time to um, begin that, you know, kind of connection and partnership and outreach, um, especially in California. I, you know, I think being in California, um, communicating with other disability rights organizations in other um, states along the border, especially Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, um, and, um, and making sure that, you know, the perspective of immigrants with disabilities is heard and brought to the forefront. Um, I think that's a really, really important thing. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So um, I guess from your vantage point, how is California, compared, if you have anything to compare it to, but how is California compared in terms of uh, uh, helping the people, but working with our people to spell community? You know, I think that California is in an interesting um, position. I think that California in many ways does things really well, um, but in other ways, not so well um, when it comes to making sure that people with disabilities have um, employment opportunities, housing, transportation, healthcare, um, and I feel like, um, you know, we should be leading. I mean, we are, um, you know, the number one economy in the country, one of the top economies in the world. We have brilliant young people, brilliant um, leaders. Uh, the disability movement started in the Bay Area. Um, so I think that California um, has a lot of room to grow. Uh, but that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited about the young people who um, are part of the disability movement right now um, in California, because I think that over the next decade, 15 years, 20 years, that the voices of young advocates um, will be lifted up um, and taken very seriously by um, policymakers, business leaders, other folks, and I think that California is a really good opportunity, especially because we have Hollywood in Southern California. We have Silicon Valley in the Bay Area. We have so much innovation um, that goes on in California. And so I think there's really good opportunities for the disability community to continue to grow. Um, and what, you know, one of our goals, we want all states to improve, but we really want people who come to California, who live in California with disabilities, to be able to say, hey, I, I'm so glad that I live in California and I, that I'm a disabled person in California because I have access to all of these things. Um, so I think California can do better, but I, I'm encouraged by um, young advocates because I think we will do better. Honestly, you mentioned it earlier about you have a fiance. First off, congratulations on uh, that. I'm just I'm curious to know how do how does disability affect your relationships? Not just with your seem to be uh, life, but in general, because how is disabilities play a role in that? 
I because I'm curious now. I I want to different differently, so I'll be continuing now. No, yeah, we're we're super excited. Um, and something that's been pretty cool for me um, and her, honestly, is um, she has embraced her own disability identity. Um, she um, embraces her mental health disabilities um, when she might not have otherwise before. Um, but because I'm, you know, in this space and because of the work that I do, she's felt more comfortable. Um, being honest and speaking about it and taking pride in it, which has been wonderful for me. Um, and I think that, you know, it's, it's a sign and it's kind of a, a message. Um, and, you know, that disabled people love and disabled people experience, um, experience uh, all the different emotions and, you um, you know, positive, negative, uh, roller coaster experiences. Um, and, you know, for me, it's been um, such a huge benefit. It's been such a positive experience for me to be in a relationship, um, to, and, and to balance work with relationship with personal life and all of those things. Because sometimes, um, and I know this question was asked really early on, but sometimes you can get really caught up um, in advocacy if you do it all day, 24 seven. So it's so nice to have um, a person or people in your life that can help you decompress. Um, so I think that, that uh, that's something that's really important for disabled people to um, to consider and to keep in mind as we're all going through um, going through different different things and um, advocating and, and personal life experiences. Thank you, Black Eric. I'll just be thank you for the evening. It's been a very singling, very singling conversation. Um, both you and me and um, with Tatum and Tammy. I'm gonna invite them back on now. Absolutely. Um, to just wrap up here. Uh, so um, we're wrapping up here, but before we do, we just want to take a minute to say thank you. Obviously to Eric for taking time out of this busy day to uh, come talk to us about his work as public policy director, his uh, wife as a Kings fan, how we can help carry out his message. So on and so forth. Um, obviously, we are amazing mentors at CFLC. Now we have Jessica to add to that list. Um, we're, we're all we're all very excited to have her and sharing our expertise and support and assistance and putting this event on. And finally, I'd be remiss personally if we didn't thank, thank our amazing ASL interpreters and our captain for providing access to me to all of you guys. So I, I greatly appreciate. You guys are unsung heroes of this event because without you, we won't have, people won't have access to you tonight. So, you guys are very important. Um, so please follow us on social media. Um, follow Yo on social media. Uh, our Twitter handle is follow at Yo Disabled Crowd or hashtag at Yo Disabled Leadership. Um, we're on Instagram um, at um, Yo Disabled Crowd on Instagram or at hashtag. Yo Disabled Leadership. We also have a podcast thing that's coming up. Yeah, that thing. Just at Disability Belongs, Disability underscore Belongs underscore podcast. You might want to go follow that because there's exciting news coming out, coming, coming soon with that. Um, and then we're on TikTok and at Yo Disabled Crowd. So, you know, next event next month is Emily White, White Gow, White Gow. Hopefully I'm saying it right. I'm going to apologize in advance for booking her name. <laughs> um, actually, on Tuesday, November 16th at 3 p.m., um, she's a past me disability rights activist, writer, storyteller, and disability communications consultant. Um, she was awarded the Paul G. Hearn Emerging Leader Award from American, American Association of People with Disabilities. And she's finally the editor in chief of a Rooting Rights Squad. A, uh, Platform dedicated to amplifying 
to find uh, authentic narratives, immutable experience from an intersectional lens. And you can register at yo, Emily Wiesel, apologies for butchering her name again. Hopefully she won't hold it against me. <laughs> and yeah, thank you for all being here tonight. And uh, please come again next month. Thank you Thanks so much. Good night. Good night.